I would like to have you to ask you to introduce yourself for the record, just so we um, know who you are, your name, your pronouns, institution, job title, and, and anything else you might like for folks to know about you. My name is Rachel Winston. I use she, her pronouns. I am the Black Diaspora Archivist at the University of Texas. Um, and in this position, I work collaboratively with several different units on campus to create a library special collection documenting Black people and communities from the Americas, including the Caribbean. So that's some of your current job description. Can you talk a little more about um, kind of your duties included in your current job and what maybe a typical day on the job looks like for you? So as an archivist, I spend a considerable amount of time doing kind of what one might consider typical archival work. So work that really centers around collecting, preserving, and making collections, records, documents accessible. And so that these days happens in the most expansive definition of that possible. So we're talking born digital materials, we're talking certainly historical kind of typical analog historical documents, art, rare books. Uh, so it keeps things interesting. I don't know that I have a typical day, which I actually really enjoy. So I do have the typical archival duties folded into my general work. Uh, but I do a lot of outreach. I do a lot of professional service. I've worked with TDL before on the TCDL, the conference. I'm pretty involved with SAA, the Society of American Archivists, and just collaborating with different units across campus. The Black Diaspora Archive over the past six years has become an engaged partner in different aspects of campus life. And so it's been really exciting to see different partnerships, um, whether it be faculty members or centers or individual students really engage with the content in, in the archive. I think hearing about kind of that professional development, those partnerships, relationships, and outreach is um, something that I think um, that that perspective is really helpful, and I think will be for other um, you know people interested in what's going on in archives. I definitely see that as the new way of archives. I feel like these days you're you can be pretty hard pressed to find an archival position that is just strictly processing. So spending most or all of your time in that dark room tucked away in the, the basement or the bowels of a building. And certainly when I entered the field, as excited as I was about archives, I knew that I just didn't have that disposition to spend all of my time um, working with records in that way. So I kind of came to this field with a experience in and excitement for outreach work. And I'm really grateful that that is something I get to do a lot in this position. Maybe that leads me to some of the kind of the biggest goals for your current job. Um, sounds like maybe outreach is a big part of that. So the biggest goal I see is kind of my ultimate charge is to help build an outstanding collection for research, for self-documentation, for, ah, for the record, right? Um, I want so, so much for this collection to be, the, this collection being the Black Diaspora Archive, to have the, the widest ranging expansive collections of documents created by and for and about people of color throughout the Americas. Uh, and for the collections that are collected, that are acquired by the archive to be done so in the most thoughtful and ethical, um, equitable way possible. Uh, so kind of Loading on all of the things as, as, I, as I do this work is important to me. Um, and I think so far that, that we've been able to do it. I certainly, while I am the only Black diaspora archivist, I couldn't do this work alone. So I do lean heavily on the 
guidance and counsel of my colleagues, both on campus at UT and in the wider profession. So I should ask maybe a little about your um, educational and career background and um, what brought you into the archive? So I am a trained anthropologist. My bachelor's degree is in anthropology and French. I also um, have had experience in the public affairs and public service sector um, and kind of through those channels uh, led me to museums and kind of cultural and cultural heritage institution, cultural spaces. And I spent uh, several years kind of interning in grant funded jobs and part-time jobs, internship, project-based work. Um, it's a rough, it can be a tough field to break into um, kind of doing public programming events um, in, in those spaces. And so it was in, in, in a community archive in my hometown of St. Louis that I had my first experience working directly with collections. I came on board as an intern to do, to help with some public education initiatives. And because the staff was small, I ended up working in the collections. And that is what turned me on to archives. I really kind of once when you're in it, when you're in the collections spaces, when you are handling those primary sources, there's nothing like it to see the actual material that then curators would use for these grand exhibitions that I would be helping people to engage with and learn from and those kinds of things. And so really kind of getting to the source of what the whole operation in these cultural spaces was about was really exciting. And so through that experience, I wanted to go back to school. I attended uh, the high school at UT to get a foundation in collections management. So I knew I um, had experience and interest and skills in the outreach piece and the public programming piece, but to have a, a better understanding with collection, on collections and how to, what best practices were like. I mean, I could guess, but you know, I just, I wanted to know. Um, I certainly never at this point in time back then, never saw myself in a university archive. I tell students when I work with undergraduate students who more so in the before times, right? They come to the archive for class visits. And I would add, you know, one of my openers is how many of you have been to an archive before? And depending on the level of the class, um, whether it's a lower division or upper division class, it depends. But most often it's rare that I have like zero people who have, yet to set foot in an archive. And I tell them they are all ahead of the game as far as I'm concerned, that I work in one, I go to one pretty much every day and I never darken the door of my university's archive. Um, but just being at UT for graduate school and getting to know um, the wonderful resources on campus and having the experience, in my learning experience in the master's program, being able to see that I could exercise a lot of my interests and skills in the cultural heritage space within an academic or university setting. I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't know that there was a connection there. I always kind of thought if you want to do community-based programs, you need to be in the community. Uh, and so it's been wonderful to be able to bring that perspective and my um, passion for that to the higher. To, to the university setting and be able to, to, to do some things with that at UT. I appreciate it. And I think that something that even for the short time that I've been in the field as an archivist, I've definitely seen that change. I feel like now you see more, granted they're not every day, right? They're not flooding our inboxes with job announcements and postings, but you do see more, more initiatives, more dedicated funding for positions that center within libraries or um, kind of glam, institu glam institutions that are affiliated with the university to, to do more dedicated community facing work. 
Uh, and so it's just really encouraging, right? Uh, especially when we think about everything, the communities these institutions are in and that long history and just the resources that we're able to leverage for the benefit of, of others. It's important to have um, community input and, and buy-in. Can I ask, so you work in, as the um, Black Diaspora Archivist. Um, what kind of digital work do you do? So most of my digital work is focused on supporting um, digital collections. So uh, most, and those take shape kind of in two, two different, most often in two different ways. So there are curated digital collections, so online exhibitions. So working to digitize material and then provide the uh, metadata to um, and time to, to upload into online platforms and make them accessible that way. And also collections more on just the general collection side. So I have worked most often, most recently actually with oral history collections. Um, and I, I was working, I had a student working with me um, for most of this year and we worked together to develop uh, an oral history collection. And so as an archivist, that's been a really cool experience. And granted, my intern, Brianna Davis, did most of the heavy lifting. So I, I don't take credit for that. But to help design a project, from, oral history project from in, inception through accessibility has been really great. Often we just get the audio cassettes or the VHS tapes and then work to make them accessible. Um, so that's been great. So in this, at this stage in the game, it's completing all of the back in metadata, preparing finding aids, the, the finding aid and ensuring secure access to all of the content that is included in the collection um, before it is made widely available, which soon comes. So I'm excited about that. Can I ask, was that um, here in Austin or like was there a specific focus of the histories you were collecting? Yes, so this oral history collection includes seven interviews uh, of women who are members of the Delta Xi chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. It is the first Black Greek letter organization that was established on UT's campus. And so these women who are interviewed um, certainly were trail are all trailblazers in their own right. Uh, but it was really fantastic to hear them speak to my, my intern at the time who was finishing up her degree at UT, connect with these women about their time at UT and their professional journey since um, the things that they built and designed and experienced as members of this sorority and also just as women on camp, as Black women on campus um, and the things that they've done since is, is so exciting. Uh, and all of them are really engaged. They help to fund a scholarship that provides funding for an intern to work in the archive. So it all kind of connects that way. Uh, and again, it's, it's really great to be able to connect with collection creators and donors. Uh, again, in an archive, you don't always get that experience. Um, so to be able to to be in contact with the, the folks whose life and work that is being documented is, is really special and something that I enjoy. Um, yeah, I look forward to that. And you said that that was something that you um, initiated that like you've seen from kind of the conceptualization and coming through here to, um, to access. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so getting ready for this project, I did as any archivist, information professional does, right? I scoured all the documentation I could find about best practices and what worked for people and what didn't. And again, so often with collections, but specifically oral histories, they come to the archive well after the fact. So to be in the archive, helping to really design an oral history project was a really neat experience. And so this is an open growing collection. And so it'll be great to see kind of how it, it grows and changes in its next iterations. I will say too that a lot of, none of this could be done without the support of UT libraries and 
specifically the team working on the dams. Just, I guess, recently, earlier this year, the dams, the UT dams um, was uh, equipped to handle AV material. And so the first uh, AV collection that's in it actually comes from the Black Diaspora Archive, which was, yeah, a really, really exciting achievement. So the first oral history collection that's in the library's dams is um, in or a collection called the Shankleville Oral Shankleville Community Oral History Collection. Uh, and that collection is a series of interviews from members of, and descendants of the Freedom Colony of Shankleville, which is located in East Texas, talking about their experience growing up there, uh, the history of the region. Uh, and again, just kind of allowing us as, as folks in this contemporary moment to really understand the significance of not just freedom colonies, but the, the people and the work that contributed to these regions that have such an impact for all of us. That legacy is so important. And so it has been a privilege to be able to work to preserve that and now make it accessible uh, for, for folks everywhere, especially folks in the region. You know, we're in Austin, not East Texas. So I'm, I'm really glad that uh, this project has helped to increase the reach of access to the collection. There are a couple of threads in there that I really like about kind of collaboration with libraries. And it makes me think about um, this, the distinction between libraries, archives, and how, how much is there? How much should there be? What is the line? What is the boundary? Should we start out? Like I keep asking those questions, even when you're in the field, even when you are in your first, second, third archivist job, always ask those questions because I don't think that anything is as absolute as sometimes it can feel. And sometimes just asking the question, like, why are we doing this? Can we do something different? Or we haven't done this before. And that just means we haven't done it before. It doesn't mean we can't do it now. Um, that approach has been um, something that I embrace. <laughs> Never be afraid to do something differently, to try something new. Um, whether it's brand new or just a, a different way of completing the same workflow. Um, why not? Why, let's, let's continue to question, right? What, what, why are there these, these boundaries? And I don't know. Sometimes I, we just, we all need to be asking more questions, I think. In a question, self-reflection and asking ourselves, asking questions of the institutions, but also, uh, also of ourselves and our personal praxis. As I, as I ask these questions, I'm definitely thinking about that because we've written them in uh, kind of this digital library's perspective and your title is an archivist. Yeah, I've, I've found myself more frequently in the past couple of years in kind of digital libraries conversations but I was hesitant to join. I don't, so I, my first year on the TCDL committee, uh, TDL reached out and asked me to join. And I was like, who me? Like, what does, I'm just an archivist. What do I have to contribute to certainly conversations around digital libraries, but then a whole conference. And so I reached out to some folks I knew who were more involved with TDL and had been to TCDL. And they kind of help again, questioning me, well, why wouldn't our, like, why, let's unpack this, Rachel. Why would you feel that your, your work is not relevant? And I was like, okay, well, I see. Okay, thank you. Questioning is important. Um, so yeah, even as an archivist, I at first kind of struggled to see that myself. Um, but, but I think that, and this might be jumping ahead in your questions. Um, I think that digital librarianship, like archives, right, is, um, is something that is woven throughout different workflows and institutions and policies and protocols in a way that sometimes we don't point to a name as, oh, well, that's digital librarianship, right? Um, and so it's important to, to name it and also create space for those conversations. Digital librarianship is just so big. And because of that, I think maybe some people may not, well, I can speak for myself. I didn't, as an archivist, didn't automatically 
see the, the fit, but but it's there. So there's because digital librarianship is so big, there is something on the table for everyone. I came into the field kind of with very isolated ideas. Everything was very kind of compartmentalized for me. Well, if, you're, if it's a digital library, then it's like the bibliotheque in San Antonio, one kind of digital entity. Um, and I, I really struggled to see, to see the, how multifaceted and inclusive this kind of work is. I saw, well, I, I wanna be an archivist. So my work is really gonna be with analog material and the physical collections, not even thinking that if we are collecting the contemporary moment, like sis, that's gonna include digital records too. I just came in kind of with blinders on uh, and met colleagues who shared the same approach. So I'm really excited for you that you are kind of opening up your thinking now and when you get into the field, it will help you to be that much more capable and effective. Well, thank you for helping me and kind of all of us to do that. Um, so now that you are, you came in with kind of this compartmentalized um, yeah. view, and now a few years in, how would you define digital libraries or digital librarianship? I see digital librarianship as being able to provide access and direction to information resources that are held in the online space or within digital platforms. So something that is super large. Um, I, while I consider myself an archivist and often will kind of shy away from that title of librarian, um, I do think that there are aspects of digital librarianship, certainly, that fall into an archival workflow. I would say, kind of as an extension of that, that digital libraries are really suites of tools and platforms and resources to collect, curate, access, create, engage with information in in the digital realm. Again, something that's really ex expansive and inclusive because that's how I see both digital libraries and librarianship is something that is multifaceted and interdisciplinary, um, but really human driven, right? The platforms and the online mechanism, hosting mechanism for access and storage and all of that are created by people for people to hold information that people have created or deemed important right so um that's one thing we can never forget the human side of things for sure as an archivist how do you think um the digital aspect of your job will change in the next five years i know for a fact that as an archivist, I am going to work more and with increasing frequency with born digital material and born digital collections. Right now, for so this is just my personal experience as kind of a traditional archivist. Um, every once in a while, I have some born digital things. And a lot of times, it's digital reproductions, so even oral histories, right? These are digital files that have been created from analog media. Um, but it's, I see it as inevitable soon um, that the traditional archival workflows that I am most familiar with will really need to be evaluated and maybe re, remixed, redesigned, reconsidered to support um, more born digital collections. I've done a little bit of this with the Benson collection and the post-custodial archiving um, work that happens with the Benson um, and partners from across Latin America. And while post-custodial archival praxis is just one example, I certainly think that um, on a smaller scale, more, um, more digital work will become a part of, of the, the life cycle 
of a collection in an archive. You mentioned earlier is kind of the digitization that you do for some of your projects. How much like digitization work um, affects your current job and like daily life? And then how shifting to born digital materials, they both have digital in the name, but how different are those processes and how do you see that like shifting the, the kind of day-to-day work for you? So right now, digitizing collections really is done um, on an as-needed basis. Um, So um, by patron request, by creator or donor request, researcher request, um, for that's that's how I I tend to approach approach it. Um, Or certainly for preservation purposes if something right needs to be digitized for that. Um, So, Mm. For large scale digitization, I do rely heavily on my colleagues who um, did work with uh, digitization in PCL um, or a part of the digitization unit in PCL preservation and access. So um, I certainly don't have, well, as an archivist at the Benson, I, we are limited in what we're able to do in-house. And so for a kind of larger scale or more um, careful or intensive kind of digitization work that needs to happen, we work collaboratively with our colleagues in PCL. And even for collections I've worked with that do have any kind of digital component, I almost always seek the counsel of uh, my colleagues who do more kind of digital archive work whether that is their title or or just part of their job function. So I I think I'll continue <laughs> to work collaboratively with with those folks. I think that while the the type of work and demands of the collections that I work with will require more technical Um, attention and care. And certainly I can provide those of my colleagues working with similar in similar situations will do that. I think that having that expertise is always helpful. (laughs) Someone who's kind of constantly in that space, who is aware of the emerging trends and best practices um, and can provide some, some guidance because I, you know, I do the best I can, but I make mistakes, right? We all do. And so it's great to have just someone you can talk to on staff about uh, who understands the kind of um, local practices and local workflows and can help navigate or circumvent challenges and provide, ultimately it's about providing the best care to the collections we're working with, right? Um, So working with colleagues to help make that happen. What do you think that um, like LIS or MSIS programs like the one at UT should be teaching students about digital work in libraries and archives? Yeah. Um, so I think back to my time at the I school. Um, I took a digital archives class, but outside of that, I don't know that I spent a lot of time in my studies critically thinking about the impact, certainly I did in that class, but outside of that class, critically thinking about digital workflows um, in, again, kind of traditional archival responsibilities. And so I think, I think one of the best things that I schools and information programs can do now is to help provide um, some guidance and an understanding in in the 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 bigness of digital libraries right to kind of help folks see the large table that is digital libraries and know that um in whatever kind of specialization you're seeking or um experience you you want to get out of your high school education that there's something on this table for everyone in that and a lot of, even though technology changes, a lot of the skills and 
kind of problem solving and critical analysis and, and thinking that these systems and workflows require is transferable, right? Yeah, the platform changes, but a lot of times needs are, they don't always stay the same, but they kind of can stay in the same realm. Um, and so I think just talking about digital librarianship, about digital libraries, digital workflows more, and certainly that could have happened since, since I was in uh, graduate school. It was several years ago now. Um, but I'm excited to see I'm excited to see what, what comes of that. Do you have advice for students who are interested in pursuing that, how to get that idea about how big digital libraries are um, and thinking critically about like digital workflows and things, whether in a digital position or, you know, in more traditional libraries and archives workflows? I think for some of us, and I'm in this number, that when you throw kind of digital in front of anything, I, I kind of have a reaction like, oh, is this for me? Oh, I don't know if I'm interested. I'm not a tech whiz. I don't really code. Like, you know, like I know just enough to be dangerous, but by no means am I a specialist. And so kind of just breaking down what can feel like um, something that is overwhelming or intimidating is helpful, right? So I think as in the graduate school experience, certainly seeking out opportunities to just familiarize yourself with, with the conversations that are happening about and around and within digital library spaces, um, but also kind of allowing yourself to be uncomfortable in, in those situations, not shying away from things that might not quite seem like they fit into what you might want to do. I think some of the most exciting projects in, in work that comes out of the field are when you see these connections between things that seem so disparate. Um, or when you're able, for me, right, when I'm able to see a, an archival collection reimagined or transformed or the meaning from it made different because of a digital tool or a platform or because it was made available, what's been able to happen. So really allowing ourselves to um, carefully, right? Always concerned about the people because, right? It always comes down to, to people and caring for people and um, the experiences that are represented in, in our collections, but allowing our, ourselves not to be intimidated so much by the digital, but rather seeing it as a tool um, a method to to create and preserve and kind of imagine anew. What do you love about digital work in libraries and archives and what keeps you motivated to work in this field? I love the creativity, kind of going back to what I was just talking about. I really enjoy being able to um, see things differently, to experience, to experience things differently, to access things differently. Um, and so often digital platforms and tools provide that experience. Um, so whether it's being able to facilitate research that is happening states or oceans or continents away because things are now available online, to even being able to reinterpret or present in new ways, um, collections or content gleaned from collections uh, in kind of the, within the digital humanities lens. And so there's just so much that's possible. And like we were talking about earlier, things are changing and developing all the time. So um, I think the digital allows for creativity in a way that is really compelling and that we might not experience otherwise. So that's kind of what always, for me, that's the sexy side of it, right? How can we use this? How can we um, experiment? How can collections, how can these tools be used to highlight 
parts of collections? How can collections be made richer or more accessible with these tools? And so seeing kind of where that synergy lies is fun. <laughs> is there anything in the collection that you really love? I do love artist books. Um, those are something I really, if I have, I will get lost in time in the stacks, just kind of perusing artist books. Um, those are always so fascinating to me um, for multiple levels, right? Just the construction, the actual, the mediums used, the, the content that is, that is shared. Um, yes. And I, I, it's a little premature, but this oral history collection will likely be one of my favorites just because the process has been so interesting. The full life cycle of an oral history to develop it and to see it happen with the help of a an intern colleague, um, and then kind of these last stages of making it available. Um, it's so hard to pick up. Every, I feel like every collection I work on is my new favorite. <laughs> so ask me this question again, like in a few weeks, in a couple months, and I'll have a new favorite because I'm working on a new collection. Being an archivist is fun that way. You get to shift 